This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScoop, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage. Hello and welcome to this Twin Peaks Investing Podcast. This is podcast number 114. We're recording this a little bit earlier. It's a Tuesday evening because Henry has to go somewhere to manicure his, um, what is it? Titive is Tash, should I say, not manicure, that's for nails. Um, It's currently nine minutes past six and it's the 14th of November. So welcome to this podcast. You can find me at Conquest 3 on Twitter, I'm here with Henry Viola here at HT Viola. And I'm here also with Alex De Groot at De Groot Media on Twitter. It's the um, three amigos, I think we're going to be start calling ourselves going forward. If we, if well, two, two of us with, with no Tash, obviously, uh, but we'll be amigos anyway. Right, we're going to catch up with Henry and uh, the growth. I'm sure you, ladies and gents, have been going on to YouTube because the numbers are slightly up. Um, but please, Henry, uh, tell us what's been happening, because that tash has definitely thickened. Um, I got a tweet, or saw a tweet, saying, you know, from Verity, I think she still loves you, mate, so yeah, yes. <laughs> it's doing some good. <laughs> yeah. So let's hear from you first, mate. Tell us what's been happening. Yes, indeed, I've been working on the tash. It's it's filling in nicely. Um, those of you that haven't seen it on YouTube, I do encourage you log in, have a look. It's uh, it's quite an impressive beastie now. Um, also, if you are watching on YouTube, you might notice I'm I'm a little little like a hamster on this side of my face. I had a, a couple of teeth ripped out of my face last week. A couple of wisdom teeth that have been causing me trouble for a few years. There was a a line of ladies weeping at the door as the uh, the dentist took a drill to my head. Uh, fortunately, I came out more or less unscathed, but uh, yeah, a little bit tender on this side. So uh, in addition to the very fetching tash, I'm also doing a good chipmunk impression this evening. Yeah, it gives the um, the tash more area to grow there, doesn't it, while it's popped out there, do you think? Exactly. <laughs> Spreads out like okay, wings. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, Alex, what have you been up to, sir? Any more TV appearances since we last spoke? Not really, no. Um, I'm available for rent or hire. If anybody needs some commentary on Walt Disney or something like that. Um, I tell you what, we've had um, we've had shocking rain up here last two or three days. Storm Debbie. Now, I've always liked people called Debbie, but the last couple of days, Debbie's... Debbie's not been nice. And um, yeah, so I've been dodging the raindrops up north and um, keeping an eye on the market, of course. And this afternoon, pleased to see that um, in the US, there was an inflation print which came in a bit better than the market was looking for. So at the time of recording our pod today on Tuesday, US indices are all in the green, all going up. Um, And the market's thinking that perhaps some of the worst concerns over inflation are are not going to be realised, which in turn means that probably rates may have peaked in the US. We've not had a rate rise, I think, now since July, chaps, in the US. Um, so are we going to get a Q4 rally, a Santa rally, Christmas rally? I, I don't know. Um, in the US, it feels as though that might be possible. So... So, yeah, I've been keeping well, um, but the weather, you know, it's that time of year when it's getting dark early. And, um, you know, it's a bit cold. So, um, but, yeah, doing fine and encouraged by the data coming out of the US this afternoon. Thank, thank you for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm encouraged by the data coming out of the US. I'm hoping that we're going to have some data that's positive for us going forward uh, yeah. for us to have that that Santa rally. I, was at, I think I was asked yesterday or the day before, what my thoughts were regarding a, a, a late uh, rally into the into the end of the year, and I had to I had to stick my hands up and go, I don't think we're going to get it this year. If we if we're carried by the Americans, that will be the reasons why we're carried. But at the moment, I'm just cautious. I'm just trimming away and getting rid of a few things. And I made a purchase yesterday of something which I'll share a little bit about uh, a bit later on. 
But I'm just very cautious. I can't see any positivity going on um, for the UK on its standing on its own. And the the I don't want to talk too much politics, but the recent shenanigans and the shuffle and you know is it is it is it Baron Cameron or is it Lord Cameron or whatever the <laughs> title is? It seems to be a lot going on um, regarding the government, and we actually need stability. Everybody wants to invest. Everybody that wants to invest in the UK wants to see stability. Um, so bring in in Lord Cameron, who's known globally. Maybe that will help. You know. I don't know. Well, I don't want to talk too much about politics. What do you want to say about that, Alex? I know you've been watching it with a keen me? interest. Well, um, goodness me. I mean, you're right. We Keep want it to clean. Politics. Keep it clean. Keep it clean. Keep it clean. Um, I mean, the one of the reasons why fund managers have lost a lot of their assets in the UK, one of the reasons is political instability. You Absolutely. know, over the last decade. What and in the last two years we've had what five prime ministers in the UK I think, or four, something like that. Lost count. And um and now of course we've got an old prime minister coming back, Cameron. Um. So, yeah, I mean the perception of political instability is still there, um, on the back of yesterday's news about the cabinet. Um. I mean, if we're thinking about what they can do to make the UK more investable. I believe the autumn statement is due next week. I believe we are due some news from Hunt, Jeremy Hunt, um, about perhaps some regulatory tweaks, which might help capital inflows into the UK. But I mean, the issue is, is that we put corporation tax up earlier this year to 25%, you know, which I think spooked people negatively, and which means we're probably not that competitive in terms of international corporation taxes. There's a lot of chat. I'm sure we both, we all have views on this chat. There's a lot of chat about a British ISA, or ISA, about various incentives that retail investors could get, about cutting stamp duty um, and various other taxes. I think all of that would be very helpful, but I think it's relatively minor stuff. Um, you know, I think really what we need is a good, a feel good narrative about the UK I'm not sure we've got that, frankly. And it does feel as though a lot of our better businesses are just being taken out left, right and centre. Um, so, yeah, we do need some good news about the UK. Uh, and yes, we have had evidence of some more political instability in the last day or so, which probably not helpful. So I think this autumn statement from Hunt over the next week, probably the last chance they're going to get to give people a steer on on why we're fit to invest here and i think we do need it i think you speak to any professional uk fund managers you know they want help you, you follow any of the brokers on twitter peel hunt pamir gordon any of those guys they're all putting forward initiatives and ideas for reforms for uk capital markets because the, these guys are hurting badly i mean they're seeing no deal flow they're seeing very little trading and very little in the way of ipos so yeah, we do need some good stuff from Hunt at the autumn statement. Um, so fingers crossed. In, indeed. I saw that the, the, the takeover agency made a deficit for the first time in, in several years. So that tells you all the, all the deal flow that's going on in the UK for them to have made a deficit. Henry, anything that you can say very quickly about the political shenanigans, uncertainty that's going on that what? you can actually share that's clean? PG, yeah. mate. No, no um, pork chop references. Um, I read a shocking line today that we've had, I can't remember if it was 16 or 17 housing ministers in the last decade. Yep. I was absolutely appalled at that. I mean, can you imagine being in the in that department? I presume it's the Department for Housing or some such, but honestly, yeah, yeah, what on earth are you supposed to do with your boss changing every six months? What a What an absolute nightmare that is. And I, I echo Alex, really, you know, we need stability in this country. We need to show that we're open for business and that we are sensible, that we've got a reasonable balanced budget, that we're investing in infrastructure, we're investing in society, we're investing in enabling workers to get to work and businesses to thrive. Uh, and until we show the world that that is the way we're going forward, I'm afraid capital is likely to continue avoiding the UK. 
Very good point. Well made, both of you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm of a similar sort of view, obviously. Rather just said that already. Um, we need something um, to stim stimulus for the markets for everybody to to think. Well, okay, let's have let's have this and invest. We've got loads of lowly um, valued companies, and as Alex and well, the three of us keep reiterating, the only catalyst we're seeing is somebody else from overseas coming to buy <laughs> the companies whilst they're on sale, which is is no good to to us at all. Um, so at the moment, let's talk about the markets and where we are, where we we are at, and we're sitting right on that little threshold again. We've had a few little dips below it for the FTSE 100, of um, below 7,400. Today it dipped below that again. We had a low of 7,386, a high of 7,456, and we closed at 7,440, uh, just up 0.2%. Um, all share was up 0.67% above the 4,000, which I keep saying is a, is a really good measure to keep an eye on uh, regarding support levels of the FTSE all share. So 4,056 is where it finished. AIM had a, a bit of a wobble and dips below um, the, the 700, as I said, a couple of weeks back. Um, today it had a low of 699.95, um, and then it had a pop later on in the day. And it actually closed up 1.26 percent, strongest move, um, strongest sort of move, um, indices wise, bar its sub in sub indices, um, closed at 709.72, up 1.26 percent. It was helped today really by the um, the FTSE AIM 50, the largest 50 um, stocks in the um, FTSE AIM all share. And some of those component parts actually that help them. I've just pulled out three stocks here that help the FTSE All Share, and they were within the um, FTSE AIM UK top 50. And the larger ones were um, CVS Group, which I think we mentioned on here a little while back, market cap of 1 billion and 50 million, what point, point point, 1.05 billion. And they were up 7.56%. Keyword Studios, I think that's had a bit of a shout out before by Alex. Obviously, they, they had a bit of a spanking recently. They popped 4.35% um, today. They've got a market cap of 1.06 billion. Uh, Jet2 um, had a pop today of 3%. Their market cap is at 2.35 billion. Fevertree, a previous favorite of everybody, it would appear, on Fintwit, no longer the case. Um, that's got a market cap of 1.26 billion, and that was up 2.13% today. So that really helped AIM outperform other indices today. Um, so that did really, really well. Um, not forgetting, obviously, FTSE 250 also did quite well today as well. So that's where we are. You know, the smaller entities are getting the the, the a, a bit of a boost, um, but the larger ones, not so much the case. And have we had a takeover yet this week? It's Tuesday already. It seems like we've not had one already this week. I don't well, think we have. I don't think we've had a takeover, but I did note this afternoon that the JP Morgan Mid Cap Trust might be merging with the Small Cap Trust. Ah, oh, yes, that's good. Um, I saw that. Georgina merge, merge together. Yeah, I, saw... I mean, yeah, I think it was about of... six months ago, Alex. We touched on about that that the the investment trusts and so on and so forth. There's going to be more mergers going on, and that seems to have carried on and carried on and carried on, um, which makes sense for those that are, are lowly valued. Right, so that's where we are, chaps. Anything that else that you've seen in the stock market that you want to share before we get we ask you, Alex, for your first stock of the day, please? Yeah, I mean, the only other thing I would flag for listeners and and perhaps invite your comments, guys. Um, I mean, I've, I've I keep a track, not every day, but most days on the oil price, Brent or WTI crude, and I have noted it down in about the low eighties dollars, and if you look at the oil price over the last i think four weeks now it has come right off from its highs um are we worried about the oil price weakening or or is it a net positive i mean my, for what it's worth my read would be that and the reason i say this is obviously that you know we don't really like talking about what's going on in the middle east too much but your intuition would be you know war in the middle east oil price up you know but in fact, it's the opposite way around. So what's our take on this oil price? I mean, for what it's worth, my take would be that I suspect demand coming out of China is probably a bit softer than had been expected. And that they, you know, at the margin, they are the consumer of most oil. So 
that would be my best guess on why the oil price is weak. Um, there will be a read across to the FTSE there because, of course, some of our biggest companies are resources stocks. Um, any thoughts, guys, on the oil price, what it might mean? Is this a blip or is it going down further? I think oh, the, the rise in rates is, is starting to damage economies. I think things are starting to squeak and generally demand is starting to, to pull back. Um, you know, I mean, there is a certain volume of oil that you're always going to consume for transport, but there are plenty of other uses for it. And like you say, China's got an awful lot of problems. The U.S., um, the US, I think, is running down its strategic reserve as well. They're, they're almost reaching the end of that, uh, which presumably affects the their ability to, to keep prices where they are. Um, but I, I suspect this is starting to signal that we're heading into a recession as well. Yeah. Which might also then speak so. to the fact that rates have peaked. Yeah. I think you've summed up what I was going to say there, Henry. The only thing I would add to that is the fact that I try to monitor the, the, the oil price per se um, indirectly by when I'm traveling back and back and forward to the school run. And there's a particular petrol station I go past almost on a daily basis. And I go, hmm, hmm. And I look at the price and go, it's going back up again or it's going back down again. And at the moment, it seems to have stabilized. Even though, the like you said, Brent and crude has got come down, that doesn't seem to be budging. You know, so if that was going down below, you know, for for un, for unleaded, um, below one 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 fifty, I, I would suspect that those that are having to travel to work on a regular basis would see the benefit in their pockets directly. But we're not seeing that yet, so it's not being transferred to the pumps yet. And I think that when that does happen, um, then we'll see some benefits for people to be able to spend more we're heading towards Christmas. Hopefully, people will be able to have a bit of money more, more money in their pocket rather than just shelving it out in on on petrol and diesel. Um, so that's one one thing I would say, additional to what's been said. This Twin Peaks Investing Podcast is brought to you in association with SharePad from ShareScoop, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. Visit sharescope.co.uk and discover the advantage. So, Alex, want to start with your first stock of the day, yeah. please, if you've got one. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, very small company. Um, so not for widows and orphans. Um, called Cordell, C-R-D-L, Cordell. Um, used to be known back in the day as Maestrano, M-N-O, back then. Um, market cap would be 10 mil. So it is a tiddler. Um, I do know the company quite well. And I wanted to just talk about it briefly because um, they've had some good RNSs in recent months, which firm up their relationship with Network Rail. Network Rail is one of their biggest customers. Now, what these guys do, I'm just going to give you a bit of context. Um, they help train companies and infrastructure owners map their infrastructure, uh, their infrastructure being rails, embankments, other bits of asset furniture that you might have in the rail network. They do it in the UK. They do it in the US. They do it in Australia, which is where a lot of the senior management are from. They do it in Japan and they do it in Europe. Now, it is a small company. It's fair to say that they haven't scaled as quickly as probably would have liked them to have done, but they are on the right track. And basically what they do is, is, is take what used to be a very labor intensive engineering process repairing rail track um by banging it with a hammer and doing using <laughs> using basically data and analytics and advanced mapping software mapping to to look at the quality of um railway um that somebody like network rail would have you know, to, to analyze every day. You can see from a from a rail company's point of view, you know, having having broken rail is dangerous from a health and safety point of view, um, but also very expensive. Um, CapEx is a big number for any rail infrastructure company. So what these guys are doing, they're trying to muscle in 
on what I think is quite an interesting space um, within sort of tech and engineering, which is basically transport, um, transport networks. Um, and small company, they've got proof of product. They are generating revenue, probably annualizing at about 6 million revenue now. Um, if you're thinking, what sort of company is this like? I've never heard of Cordell. Who are they like? It's a little bit like a company like Traxxas, which we've talked about on the pod in pre previous episodes, Traxxas, TCS, um, or, or, or uh, da -da -da, Trackmate maybe, or, or sort of uh, Microlize, who do a lot of this stuff with, with um, more vehicle related than, than, than rail related. But it's it's about it's about optimizing optimizing capex um, by using data and analytics to map your products. So it's sort of B two B transport software. I doubt very much it's a company that either of you ever looked at or heard at before because it is so small. Um, but but you could do worse than have a look at Cordell. I know the management very well, and um, as I say, it's fair to say it probably hasn't scaled as quickly. As they would have liked but i believe that their relationship with network rail is on the cusp and um, could be material to them and so cordell would be my sort of start for 10. um uh yeah cordell share price is about 5p um market cap would be just below 10. no debt yes yeah, it's, it's 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 really it sorry just to read just to finish off the you're buying it because frankly it would be a nice plug-in for somebody like WS Atkins or one of those engineering companies, Balfour BT. Um, it would be a nice tuck-in for them. Or because you believe that basically, you know, in a world of net zero, in a world of sort of, you know, decarbonisation, we're getting out of our cars into trains and the train operators need to be able to run their networks a lot more efficiently than they have done in the past. How do they do that? By having cloud-delivered cloud delivered data and analytics on their on their train tracks. I'm sure you guys, whenever you've been like coming out of Birmingham New Street or wherever, or London King's Cross, see all these guys with the big orange uniforms, the Guantanamo uniforms, you know? That's a thing of the past. We're now moving towards more drones and we're using we're moving towards data mapping. And these guys have a little part to play in that. So um Cordell, that's my sort of micro cap for today. Yeah, it's, I, I have spotted them a couple of times. I, I do um, put out a tweet um, most mornings prior to eight o'clock regarding positive or bullish RNSs, as I call it. And I'm looking at, looking for the RNSs, which are possibly going to have a bit of a pop regarding the news. And um, one of the most recent ones that I had was going back to the 27th of October when they had a new new contract win in Mexico and Australia. So despite the, this very, very micro nano cap sort of size them having been able to get contracts in australia and, and mexico is, is quite is quite good and then they had the, the update yesterday regarding network rail project updates which which again was very very positive so like you say the news flow is gaining and i don't want to use an, an, any analogies but it's gaining traction does that is that is that a good one to, you know, i like that okay. i like that that's good yeah, word, like that that's one. good word linkage there you go. There you go. So it's, gain, it's gaining some momentum there, mate. So, yeah, I, I like the look of that. I like my little nano, nano caps. Um, and my only co concern really about it is the fact that of where the H HS2 stuff is going and maybe some of the contracts that they would have had may not come to fruition now, you know, um, or will it be working in their favour because old lines need to be updated now because they're not going to extend HS2. So it could be quite, yeah, could be quite it, a good it's... one for 2020, 2024, Alex. I, I, I think so. Um, and, and often, you know, with these really small companies, what you're looking for is proof of concept and then monetization. So these guys have proof of concept. Their tech works. By the way, if anybody wants to look at their website and play around with their tech, I would recommend that um, because it's a very good website. Um, so they've got proof of concept. They're pitching to these cynical old railway engineers and they're successful. Mm -hmm. And now they're winning contracts and monetizing. It's not easy to get biz out of people at Network Rail, you know, um, or their US equivalent or their Australian equivalent. But they're, they're beginning to do that. And I, I um, Nick Smith is the is the former CEO, now the head of sales. 
and and he 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 was a great CEO, but in a way, he's a better salesman, if that makes sense. And he's now selling the product, which they've developed themselves, um, to these clients, these rail clients. And I don't know about you guys, but I I do believe that, um, frankly, one of the sort of spin-offs of 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 net zero or carbonization decarbonization will be more train travel over time. Um, and mm -hmm. so therefore the onus will be on the operators to make sure that they're run perhaps more efficiently than is the, the you know, I'm not talking about staffing, staffing, staffing the offices like, like the unions are complaining about. I'm talking about the actual physical infrastructure of running a train. Um, so it's bloody expensive to run train networks. You know, you've got to have good software to make sure that the track is in good condition. Um, yeah, I mean, you've got an, you've got a tendering expert on 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 the podcast here. You may not recognise him with a tash, but that's what Henry used well, still does a lot I, of tendering. I defer to Henry's knowledge on tendering. Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, that is a really interesting business. To be honest with you, um, I don't know it particularly well. I've got queries about why the revenue is so low after so many years. Because to me, it sounds like a genius idea that yeah network rail should be you know snapping up yeah and i also don't know enough about how you maintain a rail network to know if there are alternative options available like you say used to be a bloke in an orange jacket or a lady in an orange jacket wandering wandering around and trying not to get um you know trying you know you know trying to make sure that the line was maintained properly now you've got these drones and so on that should in theory be a lot more cost effective and a lot safer um so yeah that could be an interesting one you know i wouldn't want to bet the house on it at that size but no, no. um yeah perhaps as part of a balanced portfolio i want to tuck away and um see where they go in the next couple of years just to address one point as well you're probably wondering how do they actually get the data about the about the about the about the train line how'd you get it so at night time you have special trains that run up and down the track and they have a they have a piece of bespoke kit that sits on the front of a train and takes constant images. And the images are then fed back to the Cordell operating center and the images are analyzed. So it's their own hardware and it's their own software. And it's generally run when the train network is out of commission, no passengers, too late. A lot of the engineering work as we know on trains takes place, you know, takes place anti-social hours. Excellent. Excellent. And I need you to do me a favour because I forgot to brought the de details. If you can pull up the um, the Twin Peaks investing winners data for me on your oh, um, yes. computer before we go, and then you can you can disclose the 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 top three um, when we get to it later on. That'd be very very helpful. Um, I'm going to take a break here whilst Henry does that um, and talk about the the Memphis fundraise. Um, we are sitting at two thousand seven hundred thirty. And uh, for those of you that haven't done so yet, you can can you please visit us at um, www.justgiving.com forward slash fundraising forward slash Twin Peaks Challenge 2-3. Uh, we've had some really, really generous um, donations um, since our last podcast. Um, two of them, uh, one from Andy R. And he's all he shared is glad to help this cause. So thank you, Andy. And Andy... Uh, are donated £90. So thank you very much for that, Andy. And we've got Richard Sutcliffe. Um, and uh, um, Richard's words were, all the best and thanks for the podcast. Um, £50 plus £12 gift aid. So I want to thank you both for making those donations. And if anybody else can make a donation, we can head towards that uh, Magic 3K before, uh, before Crimbo. And we'll see what we can do um, more so going forward. Um, for those of you that are thinking about buying some beers and doing whatever you need to do, our sponsors for the Twin Peaks Investing Podcast Challenge, one of them anyway, is Powder Monkey Brewing, Brewing and Brewery. Um, they're one of our sponsors and you can visit them at um, www.powdermonkeybrewing.com and you can make your purchases with a 5% discount using the Twin Peaks uh, code. Okie dokie. I'm going to go to Henry now before he starts sharing his stock picks, uh, which none of us will probably know, um, to tell us about our winner or top three and which stocks they picked and how uh, well yes. the top three did, please. For um, This is for um, October winners, isn't it? Is it October it is winner? for October winners, Peter. October winner, um, please. So 
you share uh, that for us, please, mate. It's a, it's a great pleasure, actually. I seem to be getting more and more involved with this contest. I absolutely love running the numbers. It's great to see who's coming out on top. And this month, we've got three names that I've not seen all year, actually. Um, in third place, we've got at Euro American 13, who returned 19.9% with a portfolio that included, I'm afraid I've not got the names, I've only got the tickers, AVCT. TGR, GGR, MKA, and ATM. In second place was Sean Evans, at Sean Evans 35, who narrowly came in with 20% with ENET, CNS, BRSD, THRU, and MYX. And I'm pleased to announce that the October winner for the competition was at Get Some Four. That's at get some four with a 23% return for the month with NFX, IMC, AGL, ARK, and Boil, B O I L. Fantastic returns there, considering you know we had a poor September and we had a poor October, and still managing, you know, an average of 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 over 20% for those three portfolios is um, really, really good. So congratulations to get some four. Um, if you can get in touch with us um, via Twitter, DMs, etc., open Twitter, and um, I'll get your um, details off you and get them to to um, to share scope so you can get a trial um, of their software solutions. And also a book of your choice. I'll, um, I'll send you the link to the um the 15 books you can choose from and you can select a book from that and obviously you're on your way um to being one of our or all three of you regarding the overall prize which we'll talk about on the next podcast as well um going into what is we've got five weeks maybe six weeks left and we'll be disclosing the the overall winner uh, for the whole comp so um good luck to everyone that's still in in the running really appreciate you um sticking with us Thank you, Henry. Um, you're gonna do you want to carry on, or do you want me to quickly say something about one stop before you do one? It's up to you. I'm happy to carry on and do another if you like. Go for it, mate. You get your first stock out there. Let's hear right. it. Right. Um, well, the first uh, stock I've got is take a guess. It's an American stock, United okay. Microelectronics Corporation, which is a global semiconductor foundry business. The company provides integrated circuit production for applications spanning just about every sector of electronics. So we're talking microchips here, effectively. They operate through two segments, wafer fabrication, which manufactures chips to the design specification of customers, and what they call new business, which undertakes research, development, manufacturing, and provision of solar energy. Now, the microchip sector and the chip making sector has had a really interesting year. You know, we had NVIDIA that went absolutely gangbusters halfway through the year, and everybody seemed to think that we were going to survive on nothing but microchips and a steak every evening. Um, the demand for this has pulled back slightly, actually, as people as governments around the world have started hiking interest rates. And actually, a lot of the chip makers have started putting out profit warnings and softening outlooks. Um, on Wednesday, the um, this particular company, United Micro Microelectronics Corporation, the ticker is UMC, said that they were seeing gradually stabilizing demand in the fourth quarter of this year after a period of recent rush orders for personal computers and smartphones during COVID. Uh, had slowly sort of dissipated and the inventory backlog that people had built up slowly started to dissipate and so demand was starting to normalize again. Um, their biggest Taiwanese rival is TSMC which is the Taiwanese Semiconductor Manufacturing Corporation. And they're actually the world's largest contract chip maker. Uh, and they said last week that the semiconductor industry could be poised for a recovery predicting healthy growth for themselves next year um, and a drop in inventory levels as manufacturing starts to pick up again. Now, UMC is available on a PE of about 10. It's got a dividend of 6%, covered 1.4 times. 
It's grown its um, revenues, its compound annual growth rate of 13% since 2017, and it's grown its earnings per share on a compound annual growth rate of 56% over that same period. So if you're interested in the semiconductor space, but you think NVIDIA is a little hot, um, and you maybe are looking around the sector at some alternative picks, I think UMC is a really interesting name you might want to go and have a look at. Cool, cool. Any thoughts there, Alex, for that one? Well, we like the space, don't we? And the valuation there. We, that do. Henry's we talking like about. our chips. We love our chips. Um, and that valuation Henry's talking to there is 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 not demanding at all. And it pays a dividend. So I can't claim to know the company well, but I do like the space that they're in. And, you know, in terms of the demand side, that isn't going to deteriorate too much. Um, so, yeah, I like the sound of that. Thank you very I'm much. Always, well, I, I think as a general rule in investing, if you can sometimes, I mean, I'm going to come on to talk about a, a big company later, but sometimes if you can, if you can get a big company and then you can find somebody else that does something similar, but perhaps operates at a smaller scale, not well known, it can be quite a shrewd way of, of, of getting exposure without necessarily paying up for the for the very biggest and the best. And I wonder if UMC might be in that camp. Possibly, possibly. I'm I'm gonna go into the camp of a very, very small, unloved. And you know, not necessarily thriving company, um, looking for a potential turnaround slash recovery here in 2024. Um, don't want it to be taken over, uh, but it's one of those stocks which has been around for a long time. It does quite a bit regarding um, manufacturing and distribution of natural animal feed additives uh, for animal health, nutrition, and biosecurity. The company I'm talking about is Anpario. Um, only got a market cap of 48 um, million, um, price range 177 um, to £5.20. It's had a terrible 2023. PE is a bit rich at 20.9, um, yield at 4.4. Um, they did a tendering process in June and concluded it in July of this year, um, where they did a premium of 19% of at the time at um, £2.25. Um, and it's currently the share price is just below that. What interests me here is what they said in their um, September half year results. And basically they were poor, the results were poor, no, no getting away from that. However, what they said was cash balances and including short term investments were of 7.3 7 million. That's after they'd offset about 9 million for the tendering process. Um, but they were saying basically that they'd be benefiting from the cost reductions they put in place and the efficiency improvements they implemented in the first half of the year and expected that to then roll over into 20, in the end of 23 and into 2024. And basically they were saying that the regulatory environment as well would help them moving forward. So I'm hoping that regarding all the different bits and pieces that they do, and again, they're global, America, Asia, Europe, Middle East and Africa, including obviously the UK, that those sort of delays, revenue streams that haven't come online, et cetera, et cetera, will start to to to, to grow um, going forward because we all need to eat. We all need our animals to be healthy and animal feed is something that's going to help, um, you know, offset other things that are going up in costs, you know. Um, so I just thought it was an interesting one. It's one that was at Fiverr before. It's now sub two quid um, or there or thereabouts. I just thought 50 million quid. For a stock that's been 250k at one stage a few years back, as a possibility of the turnaround, and I'm always looking for reg tech, looking for regulatory environments to to change things for for companies as well. Um, so it's not one that I've seen lots of people talking about. I don't know if anybody owns it. I don't know if anybody's talking about it, but it's not on the radar at the moment, and I'm not interested in what everyone else is talking about. So I don't own it because, as Henry answered to somebody else today about a stock that's gone up, uh, we tend to, not to try and um, give research tips regarding stocks we own on here. So it is it is what it is. Anybody yet looked at Empario before or knows I about it? I love Empario. That's, that's, I mean, not just because it starts with an A, but it is near the top of my watch list, to be honest with you. 
Um, so I'm a little annoyed if that shoots up after this podcast. I don't own any at the moment, so don't go out and buy it, people. I want some. <laughs> it's on your watch. Um, How long has it been on your watch list, Henry? About two years. Wow, that's proper patience, mate. Well done. About two years, um, and it's always looked super expensive to me, but I like the sector. It's not flashy. It is a very basic business. I mean, I, I don't mean that in an offensive way. If there's anyone from Amparo yeah. on the call, you know, but it's a business I can easily get my head around. I can understand it. I can look at the balance sheet and understand it. I know what they do as a business. You know, I feel like I could walk into one of their sales rooms and have a sensible conversation with one of their sales managers. Um, and I like that in investing, you know, as much as the technology side of things interests me and the financial side of things interests me, I like to know and understand what I'm investing in. And Ampario is um, very much in that category for me. Yeah, and, and and for you, it's got a little bit of cash still on the books, just a little bit of cash on the books, but exactly, you know, <laughs> it's not too bad. Alex, have you looked before? Any yeah, thoughts on it? I I know a little bit about the company. Um, what what um what I'm trying to remember is what what was the market reaction to that? You said the I think the first half results were a little bit shaky early this year. Did the market sell off the shares then? I can't quite remember what happened. They've been selling off all year, Alex, in fairness. Yeah. Um, and they tried to offset that a little bit by doing a tendering process um, yeah. back in June, July, and concluded it at 2.25. Uh, at the time, it was a case of, how did they pull that off? Yeah, yeah. 90% premium of tendering. Yeah. But they did. Um, obviously, the price is just below that now. Yeah. Um, but I, I just think it's this is all about execution. We can, we can do all the research we want, as I always say, um, and you can pick an undervalued company, but actually what matters is whether the management and the leadership team execute on what they say and don't come back out um, three months, six months down the line. We're going, uh oh, we didn't actually execute that strategy. And here's a profit warning and knocks you on the chin. And the share price right now, as we know, any profit warnings, you're looking at 30, 40, 50 yeah, percent, you know, yeah. and, you know, getting smashed. So we can do without that going forward. And any, I think a bit of momentum, like you say, with them. Um, Cordell, one or two pieces of good news, and that start that stock starts to get re-rated. I don't yeah, own it, yeah. but I'm just saying yeah. it's a possibility. I'm I'm yeah. not interested in the stocks that everyone else is ramping. Yeah, yeah. No, it sounds good, Pete. It sounds good. I think what 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 you'll find probably is that um I don't know if you guys saw this, but the Downing Microcap Fund is gonna liquidate. So with the JPM Morgan, the JP Morgan. Did you see that? Did you, did you guys see that news? I, I haven't missed that. I, I was gone all day today, mate. I've not been on the markets all day yeah, today. Pretty new news, I think. I mean, they've announced they're going to liquidate. And, and then we've seen the JP Morgan sort of fund merger today being announced. So it may give rise to a little bit of forced selling on liquidation. I'm not saying that's going to affect Ampario, of course, but it could affect some stocks that we talk about on this pod. Of course, yeah, yeah. Um, where the fund managers have to sell to liquidate to you know to to return the assets to the to the original owners so that is something to be aware of in the background um but yeah i'm with you i like stocks where there's a sort of regulatory need to you know to, to have their product um i think that's got to be a good thing um we're in this really weird market right now where we've got some great companies but we don't have any investors I mean, that's the reality. Absolutely, absolutely. I, th I think I think going from what you've just said there, if, we re if on on advisement, I would say to for people listening, and um, wherever they are in the world, um, have a look at that Downing uh, fund and look if you can at the top ten, top twenty stocks that they hold. Um, and if they are going to liquidate, have a look, make sure that it's not one of your stocks. And if it is, you know, consider getting ahead of them <laughs> and get out, you know, yeah, or reduce. Yeah. Um, but that's just. Yeah, no, not advisement, yeah. just yeah. um, you know, yeah. consideration. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okie dokie. Over to you then, Alex. Second stock, if you've got one, please. Yeah, um, it's a mega cap. Um, and it has results tomorrow. It has its first half results tomorrow, Wednesday. So by the time the podcasts come out, I could look very clever or very stupid. Um <laughs> the, the company is Experian, um, which right. is a twenty-five billion dollar company. FTSE 100 company, mm -hmm. RIT code is EXPN. And I think most people will have heard of Experian. 
if you know companies like Equifax and TransUnion, then you'll know what Experian is all about. It's got huge market opportunity, um, basically plays in B2B and B2C um, in, in, in anything from um, credit to, to fraud to identity, um, credit risk, digital marketing, identity prevention, um, very heavy recurring revenue bias. There's nothing really new I can tell people about Experian in terms of what they do. It's a big global company. But what I'm looking for are companies that um, have been left behind from the stock market. And basically this year, Experian has done nothing share price wise. I think it's down about 5%. NASDAQ is up about 35%. So US growth is on a flyer in 2023. UK growth has gone nowhere. Um, Experian is based in Dublin, but it's a UK company, but two thirds of its revenues is in the US. What is it doing being listed in the UK if we are genuinely worried about valuations and investor sentiment towards growth stocks, which seems to be one of the themes we're hearing a lot this year. Um, in addition, if any company is going to have an AI angle, it's going to be Experian. And yet it never gets talked about as an AI stock or as having any you know, um, credible presence in, in, in AI or data, but all they have is data. That's what they do is collect data for businesses and consumers. So the name has been left behind and I think there's a reasonable chance they could end up looking to relist in the US because I don't really think the name gets enough traction in the UK. If you could buy it in the UK on a PE in the low 30s and then it relisted in the US, on a PE in the mid 50s, there's a nice arbitrage there. Um, the longer they remain listed on London without much interest, I think the more they will feel the pressure to relist in the US, where I think their business would be much more familiar to most investors. Um, so very good company, does about $6 billion of revenue, 25% operating margins, strong balance sheet, Total market opportunity they have is probably over 100 billion. So lots to go for. You know, it's the Terry Smith thing. Don't look for winners. Don't look for new winners. Just back the existing winners. This company is an existing winner, already has high margins. It's got the moat that everybody talks about, um, but it's done nothing share price wise in 2023. Pull up the chart. Um, so Look, I could look at a mug in a few years' time because they could have a profit warning tomorrow, but I think it's very unlikely. Organic growth is between 4 and 6%, so it's growing quite nicely in spite of weak macro, and there is a good, healthy underlying operating margin. So I'm looking for neglected names that could re-rate either from moving to the US or because people want to reinvest in growth names with interest rates coming down, um, and I think this would fit the bill. Looks to me like it's been left behind. So I'm going to try and nick a bit of performance from buying some Experian shares. I think it's probably good for about share price, about £35, which would give me about 25% upside from where we are at the moment. It pays a dividend, but it's not really a dividend story. It's a capital growth story. Um, so, yeah, Experian, mega cap, complete opposite of Cordell. But I think there are certain <laughs> things that will work in its favour. It's on my watch list, mate. Um, I am waiting for the data tomorrow. Um, I've I've noted the data, the data analytics that it does. I'm looking at the mortgages. I'm looking at the autumn statement. I'm looking at pensions reform. All the stuff that's going to be another ca catalyst for them going forward regarding people crunching numbers and looking at what they're doing and checking their credit rating for all manner of different things. Um, and tomorrow could be the crunch. If it comes out with some good, solid numbers, I'll probably be in the market. If If not, um, I will wait a bit longer to see what happens. Um, I didn't I didn't see or consider um, the possibility that I'm listing over in the US, to be honest with you, Alex. Um, the AI and big data side of it was definitely the, 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 the bit that's got me sitting over the, the buy button. Um, but that would be another catalyst. I just don't I just wouldn't want them to list over there, to be honest with you. I can see the reasons why the management would want that. Um, to happen because then they'd be on a, a similar sort of rating to Equifax and get a boost towards their, their valuation. But again, we're going to lose another um, FTSE 100 company, essentially. Even if they just do dual listing, it still just changes it a tad, I think. 
Um, so I'd rather they stayed and um, and we value them up to what they should be and doesn't become another arm situation where somebody buys them, takes them private and then lists them in the US in, in three or four or five years time. Um, sitting on what? What is it now? Just shy of 24, sorry, 24 and a half billion market cap. It's a sizable company and it's done exceptionally well for investors since it's IPO'd. Yeah, I mean, it was, I think, as we all know, it was spun out of a, of a home products business. Um, I mean, the other thing I, was, I should just flag is that a high proportion of their revenue will be recurring because it will be on a yep. syndicated basis. Now, yep. if we were doing this podcast two or three years ago, we would be valuing data businesses on multiples of seven, eight, nine times revenue or ARR, as we used to call it, annual recurring yep. revenue. You know, I want to say that probably 70% of experience revenue is recurring. Um, so, you know, you plug seven or eight times into that revenue, you're going to get a lot more than the current market cap. Um, so I, I think there is a valuation angle here. Um, I think they have a moat. It's been left behind this year for various reasons. But it's weird because NASDAQ is up 30% this year. But UK growth is probably flat to down. So it is an anomalous position. Um, in a way, what we need to do is record the pod today and then have another pod tomorrow so we can analyze the <laughs> First half data. If only you could do that. If only we could do that. Fingers crossed for the good news yeah. tomorrow. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. It's a, but this is it. It's, I don't even think it's recognised as a tech stock. It's no. almost like it's a consumer staple. Yeah. I know the PE is high, but it's not recognised as a tech stock, and that's what it is. It's a big yeah. data stock, same as almost not not the same as. If you look at Relex, not many people recognise that as a tech stock, but it yeah. is. Yeah. You know. So yeah, I'm, I'm biased. Parallel... But I'm, tomorrow I'll be hovering over that seven o'clock hour next and having a quick look, mate. So, I think the, uh, parallel, we, the we parallels with relics are quite good. That's a good. That's yeah, a good peer. Absolutely. That's a good reference. You know, these are businesses that, in theory, should compound, at yeah. maybe between eight and twelve percent every year for ten years. So you think you're mm -hmm. buying it on a P of thirty, but actually, if you look at five years, P drops to like fifteen because it's compounding yeah. every year in a way that a cyclical company won't compound. Won't. So. Yeah, um, yeah. It's, quite, it's quality at a, a decent price, mate. That's what I that's what I, I think, sir. QR, QRP. Okay, um, Henry, did, have you thought about it? Looked at it? You know, shaved I am on it? Experian. Um, again, it's another one that's on my watch list. This is rather spooky, to be honest. We can't my, all be over over the bump tomorrow. Well, no, we won't. Because my big reservation, unlike Amparia, which is at the top, this is near the bottom of my watch list. This has always looked oh, okay. insanely expensive to me, and it still does. And my big reservation, it was on quite a reasonable valuation 10 years ago, a bit over that. And it seems to me that there are a number of stocks that as soon as central banks started quantitative easing and putting money into the market, they absolutely shot through the roof. And they continued doing that for 10 years and everybody thought they were geniuses because they bought Experian 10 years ago. And then as soon as the government stopped putting money into the market, they sort of hit a peak and then they've slid for the last two years. And my big worry with companies like Experian is that they are quite expensive. I know you rate it as a growth stock and it's got the compounding story and the tech angle to it. But what if that multiple just continues to slide and slide? It's currently a 21, 22 times, you know, is, is 22 cheap, 18, 16, 15? You know, at what point do you say this is a screaming buy? Because it's got a lot of air to come out of it, in my view. I I'm, think not sure just I as much... I'm, not, I'm not sure I agree with lots of air coming out of it, Henry. I think it's one of those stocks that it's got that valuation for a reason. Mm. There's, very, you know, and we talk about moat and the size. If you talk about what they do, there's another two companies of that sort of ilk. What's the other one apart from Equifax now? Um, uh, TransUnion, I think. Um, right. Okay. So there's not there's not many of their ilk ar around. Yeah. You know, there's there's there's, 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 there's you know three companies. You out may, there have, a, you may, doing, you so. may have a point there. I may be being harsh on them. My my perception yeah. of them has always been that they are quite expensive for what they are. Yeah. yeah. And that's having said that, I've been yeah. saying that for ten years, and the share price is as <laughs> skyrocketed so you but, know what do i know <laughs> yeah it, it is what it is mate we've, we've got it you've got to stick to your own metrics though this is it if you think it's overvalued with that sort of pe stick to your metrics don't ever be swayed by anybody else you know i keep saying there are no gurus out there 
you know, so everybody needs to do their own research and do that and get to gain their own conviction on their own deep, deep anal analytics regarding the stock, um, irrespective of whether they're 24 billion market cap or a 10 million pound market cap. Now, Henry, um, do you want to go to your second stock and Absolutely. tell us all about that? I've got one Go which I think um, some of our listeners are really going to enjoy researching here. I guarantee you've not heard of this. Absolutely guarantee it. It's a £50 million market cap company that manufactures security products for alarm systems and produces labour saving devices, which uh, are basically a line of tools for wire and cable runs. The company is George Risk Industries. The ticket is RSKIA. It was founded in 1965 um, and they are based in Kimball, Nebraska, with a satellite plant 40 miles away in Goering, Nebraska. Excellent. I love the battle for those rocks. that can't see me on YouTube, I'm throwing my hands up in the air going, what? Now, the reason I think some of our listeners are going to enjoy this one is because it is a very, very small, very, very niche business that manufactures a very, very specific line of products very, very well. It's on a PE of 9.7 with a yield of 5% twice covered. It's had compound annual growth of revenue of 11% since 2018 and compound annual growth in earnings per share of 14% over that same period. Now, considering some of the micro caps that I've seen people on Twitter investing in in the UK, um, you know, I'm thinking of businesses like Calnex, for example, might not be a micro cap, maybe a small cap, but very, very niche specialist products. And people have gone away and they've done their research and they've determined that this company produces this product very well, I'll invest in it. To me, George Risk Industries is one of those companies that does something similar. Um, it's got a 25% operating margin. So this is a you know quite profitable, well-run business. It's not got analysts all over it because of the size. And to me, it looks like quite a good value play. You know, it's one of those businesses that I think you could tuck away in your portfolio and you could leave it alone for five years and come back in five years. It'll probably be doing slightly more in revenue, slightly more in earnings per share. It'll have paid you a nice dividend. You know, I think that's got a, a really interesting story to it. And possibly best of all, whilst I was doing my research, I discovered that the company is led by Stephanie Risk McElroy which I thought was an absolutely fantastic name. And Stephanie is the chief executive officer, president and board chair. But I thought, honestly, Stephanie Risk McElroy, absolutely fantastic name. So there you go, ladies and gentlemen, George Risk wow. Industries. The ticker is R-S-K-I-A. Do your worst. Do your but, worst. And Henry, well, what, I don't, I don't want to say that. I'm going to give that exchange? straight over to you, Alex. What have you got to say about that one? Is it is it on the New York Stock Exchange? What, it's on what? the Nasdaq. On the Nasdaq, right? Okay. I've got to be honest; I've never heard of it, but I'm going to look into it imminently. Excellent. I'm not I even. I'm not even going to look wanna... just in ca just in case I like it, Alex. I'm not yeah. even going to look. <laughs> and then I think we should go on a team site visit to Nebraska. Excellent. Yeah, absolutely. We'll have to wrap up at this time of year, I suspect, as well. <laughs> yeah. That's it's going to be cold in Nebraska um, right now. Yeah, that's an amazing find, um, Henry. I, I'm I'm waiting to just poo poo for one of your stocks. I, I'm sitting here going, ah, you can't pull out another <laughs> one, and, and and you've done it again. I suspect um, Mr. Risk Management over there has probably got um, a tash as well, has he? If you see his profile, <laughs> did he have a tash? <laughs> oh dear, I'm going to be very quick. So I'm conscious of the time here. Um, yesterday, I sold um, my final tranche of Pendragon at um, 32 pence. Uh, locking in a profit of of more than 103% on that. So I've completely exited it now. I'm now waiting for the transition um, regarding the, the sale and the takeover and what they're going to do with Pinewood. So I've I've done, I've immediately utilized some of that funds straight into another stock, which I'm not going to share on here. But essentially, this is another stock where I've, I've used the security analysis book and my research. I've been pouring over it backwards and forwards for the last year and a bit. I've analysed that the intrinsic value of this particular stock I bought 
and some parts is almost there or thereabouts a 50% discount. Um, so I'm going to try my luck again, given that's what I saw with Pendragon and see if I can compound the returns from Pendragon into this next stock in the next three to 12 months or so. Let's see what happens, irrespective of me being cautious on the market. I just wanted to just try again to try and um, get some returns on my some of the cash that's sitting on my portfolio. I'm going to quickly talk about one last stock on my thing here. And it's a it's one I'm sure Alex and Henry and some of you have already been in and utilized in the past. And it seems quite a contrarian sort of play here. And Henry's not going to like it because it's it, it saddled with debt. Um, but um, sometimes you've got to hold your nose, as they say, um, and see what happens. And I'm, I've gone towards this because of what's happened with restaurant group. Uh, so it's in the same sort of hospitality sort of um, sector. And it's um, Mitchell's and Butler, not the cigarette, but the, um, the restaurant and pub chain. It's riddled with debt. Um, it's on a low PE. It's got a market cap of 1.38 billion still. Um, so it's got a lot of property underneath its belt. I suspect they could get rid of some of that. Um, and I just, I'm just looking at the sales and what they're saying and all the rest of it and outlook. And it would appear every time I go out, not just because I go out, but when I go out socially, lots of people are still going out to the pub and having meals and eating out on a Saturday and Sunday. Um, and I'm wondering whether or not some of that will spill over or continue during the Christmas period and whether or not they'll come out with some good numbers for November and December with all the so, you know, Christmas parties or Xmas parties, because those people that are working from home are going to come out with their team, the colleagues, and actually celebrate having not seen their colleagues. And there could be some more dues and pubs could do well over, or MAB could do well over, over Christmas. Um, price range at the moment, um, 119. Um, November last year was at 243. And the September update wasn't too bad. I just, I don't know. It's unloved. No one's talking about it. Everyone talks about JD Witherspoon. Um, no one talks about Mab. We'll see. When was the last time in a Mitchell and Butler's, uh, Butler's um, Henry? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, actually. What, do they trade as Mitchell and Butler's? I'm not sure I've ever been in one. Yeah, you can usually see, you can see there's a sign outside of the, outside the door. I honestly, like, yeah, know, I don't think like I've ever branding. been in one. We've like got green, a lot of like green King pubs. in Norfolk. You usually see the branding all over the, the frontage. Yeah, I see a lot of Green King pubs as well, for that matter. Um, yep. You're yeah, not looking I up, mean, mate. You're going straight into the bar. That's what it is. Yeah, exactly. That's the problem. I'm running in there. <laughs> Three pints of Guinness. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just give me some fish and chips with that as well. What about you, Alex? Have you looked into uh, Mitchell and... And oh, you know what, um, Pete? I was just looking at the, the it's got a great chart, isn't it? I mean, it's made people a lot of money, this stock. Um I wonder if some of the bad stuff on the consumer is a bit overdone, and particularly heading into Q4. You know, these guys would be beneficiaries of that. I mean, if they're able to serve I'm thinking. Them, that should be all right. Am I right in thinking O'Neill's is one of these guys' franchises? O'Neill's? Yep. Yep. I think so. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, I mean, if 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 the situation with the debt is not onerous, and the trend in the trading is generally satisfactory, I think buying into Q4 is probably not a bad shout. Um, if you look at the chart, you might think, well, it's already rallied quite a lot this year. But I've seen these things double, treble, quadruple. You know, so don't be put off by a healthy chart. Um, it 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 doesn't look that distressed to me at all. So, um, yeah, I mean that's a good shout. I think. Yeah, I, I'm not I'm not necessarily an expert on consumer type stocks, but I think if you think rates have maxed and they're going to start coming down, then you do want to have one or two consumer stocks in your portfolio. I'm classifying it as a consumer stock, not you know. Yeah. Which may be unfair, yeah. but um, yeah, good 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 shout. I think one of the it's big questions, one, the big, yeah. one so of the big go on, questions go that I've got about um, pub type businesses and restaurant type businesses is the ratio of working capital to assets that they've got. A lot of them are quite property heavy. 
So they look as though they've got yep. plenty of assets on the balance sheet, but you can't sell a third of a pub to fund your cash flow requirements. And so actually they could end up being in distress fairly quickly. You know, it's not as though the landlord's going around selling off, you know, the chairs or something. Um, mm. I don't know if that's the case with Mitchell and Butler. You know, I've not looked at the balance sheet, but that would be a a, a query I'd have when looking at restaurant type businesses. Yeah, my, my thing was looking back at um, lockdown and looking at the number of pubs that got slashed, slashed and reduced and portfolios reduced. And the, the fact that JD and Mab and I think Fullers is the other one, the main one, they've all done reasonably, they've navigated it okay-ish. And if we don't have a recession next year and they do have a good um, latter part of 23 and a, a good beginnings to 2024, a lot of the negativity that's already already in the price, I think could help them. You know, And if like wage increases don't keep going and inflation comes down, all their input costs, should reduce as well um and maybe they can negotiate better on the debts that they've got as well so that that's me just looking at all the different scenarios that could be positive the 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 bare points they're huge you know massive debt there you know inflation could remain sticky inflation could go up uh, interest rates could go up again in the second half of next year so you know So it's, it's, it's one of I wanted to. I was, it's hard. It's getting harder and harder for me to find stocks that no one else is talking about, and I don't see anyone talking about Mab on Twitter. So that's why I've I've suggested it. There are loads of reasons why not to buy it, um, and this is why it's just a, a research idea. And I'm always saying, and you're saying, Henry and Alex say, go away and do your own research on it. This is not a tip. It's not a recommendation. Go away and research it, and then come back on Twitter and say you're a nutter. Stay well clear, <laughs> if, think, if you so feel like it. I think with debt names, the general, for me, professionally, the key thing with names with a lot of debt is, you know, what, what is the interest cover? In other words, if I take the profits and divide that through by the interest payable, is it more than three or two and a half? If it is, you know, they can, they can live with it. But, you know, dear Mr. Investor, do realise that, you know, Debt always comes before equity in terms of structure of things, particularly in the liquidation. So you just need to get comfortable with the debt. But debt is not a bad thing per se. It's just the structure of it. Yeah, structure and the servicing of it. Yeah, absolutely yeah. agree. Absolutely agree. Now, that, that's that's all for me. I just wanted to say a, a big thank you to everybody that's given us um, some really good feedback and um, retweeted and reshared the podcast and, and showed the support for it. Please, 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 can you continue to do that? On average, um, the last two months or so, within the first 24 hours, we're getting a thousand people listening to this podcast, and the other 2,000 plus are doing it over the rest of the the the, 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 the next two weeks. We need to have more of you just, you know, um, just commenting and sharing and and giving us the feedback on it. We've got two um, co-hosts on here that are giving you guys loads and loads of value regarding the research they're putting in. Let them know what you're thinking of regarding what they've suggested and speak to them on Twitter or let them know via YouTube. And if you haven't subscribed to YouTube yet, please do so. And let us know um, what your thoughts are regarding the podcast. And thank you for your continued support, ladies and gents. Alex, what do you want to round off with? Um, just looking forward to seeing more progress in Henry's Tash. That, that's what I think about. <laughs> that's it. Okie dokie. Love that. <laughs> Okie dokie. <laughs> and you, Mr. Mr. Bearded One, Mr. Tash? <laughs> um, yeah, I'd just like to say uh, thank you very much to everybody that does write in, that texts, that calls, that, you know, I, I've had letters through the blog that have been lovely. Um, please don't be shy. It, it honestly makes my day when I get a message from someone. It means a lot to me. Love the fact that people are tuning in and engaging with the ideas we've got. I love having a good debate with someone about investing and to be honest with you, that's why I started doing the blog in the first place. I love talking about this stuff. So don't be strangers, please. Absolutely. Love that last, last point. And uh, I would say as well, we've had some um, fantastic individuals on the Investing Matters podcast. So if you haven't done so yet, you've got Michael Hewson. You've got a chat from America tomorrow um, going live on the Wednesday called Brian Pellegrini. And soon you'll have a lady by the name of Iona Bain. She's the BBC 
morning live financial expert. So we've got some fantastic guests going on there. So please uh, have a listen over there at those podcasts as well. And in between now and what will be, I think the 29th is the next recording of, our, of this particular podcast. Um, take care. God bless and good luck um, navigating the markets. Take care, everybody. God bless you all. As a Twin Peaks Investing Podcast listener, you can access an exceptional offer via SharePad from ShareScope, the UK's number one investment data and analysis software for private investors and traders. This special Twin Peaks offer is available to new subscribers only, and you can subscribe using the promo code TWINPEATS. The incredible and exclusive offer means that Monthly subscribers will get their second month free and annual subscribers will get their 13th month free. Sign up and subscribe to SharePad today using the Twin Peats promo code and you can save up to £69. Visit sharescope.co.uk forward slash sharepad for further details and subscribe to the investing and trading analysis and data you need.